So I'm here with Dr. Yeah. Alex Paziotopoulos, and I had a, another strong Greek name on my show not too long ago. And uh, so I want to be sure that I was able to, to ask your name and pronounce it properly. And I think I did that. So welcome to the show, my friend. Uh, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So I was just telling you directly and I'll share it with the audience. So what we're going to talk about today, I want to say it's pretty new to the show. I don't know if I've ever talked to anyone about, you know, this line of, of medicine or philosophy of medicine or practice of medicine. It's something that I've learned a, a decent amount about listening to people on podcasts, read some books probably that, that inform me as well. But can you give kind of a brief overview of, of, you know, who you are and, and what you study and what you teach. Sure. Um, kind of came to medicine a little bit later in life. So uh, was a builder for a long time. And uh, well, before that, went to undergrad at University of Illinois and did environmental science and uh, did some physical anthropology, studied monkeys. Didn't use, use any of that. <laughs> yeah, when you were saying a builder, what, what do you mean a builder? Oh, I used to be a general contractor. Okay, so went from like anthropology to contracting. And I was trying to put those two together. Like maybe he like uh, he's a builder in quotes. Yeah, you know, at home for like summers, I would always uh, do some building and stuff, um, remodeling, things like that. So anyways, it just kind of turned into a business. And one of the things I learned um, building is uh, project management. So uh, you have to have really good project management or you can't do that. So anyways, later I ended up selling that, uh, studied yoga, became a yoga teacher. Then I started martial arts and uh, went into Shaolin Kung Fu and uh, could help a lot of people that way, you know, through, you know, those practices, helping them spiritually, you know, get their life back together or like actually find their path in life and, Breathing, meditation, movement, I mean, it makes you better, it makes you healthier. Um, but I was like, I think I could do more. And so I went back to school for neuroscience and um, biochem. I ended up going into medical school. Um, after medical school, started residency um, in uh, family practice because I wanted to do something more general. And that family practice was integrative medicine in residency. There's more too many of those. Um, at the end of medical school, I started working with uh, American Academy Anti-Aging Medicine and began a fellowship with them to learn functional regenerative medicine. Ended up doing another fellowship with them with stem cell therapeutics. Uh, did some workshops in peptide therapy. Now I'm doing aesthetics fellowship. So it's just constant learning and uh, going on and on. And then, you know, about four years ago, I started working with RADFEST, uh, Revolution Against Aging and Death and Bill Falloon, uh, the head of Life Extension, and started doing age reversal protocols. Um, because what we were finding was that you can only slow down aging so much. It's a lot easier to actually reverse the process than it is to slow it down. And so that whole medicine is just accelerating at incredible speeds, and there's lots of money being thrown into it. Um, but there's not a lot of clinical. So there's a lot of research going on for age reversal, tons of money being spent by pharmaceuticals in it. Um, but there's nothing really being done to really help the people except between like Bill Falloon and the people like me that are on agereversal.net that are actually trying to implement these age reversal strategies for people. Um, and that's where we're at right now. And so in order to really get this going, because there's so many moving parts, right? There's like your lifestyle, there's your diet, right? There's all the supplements you're taking, there's all your lab values, there's your hormones. I mean, like it just goes down the list of all these things you have to do. And the only way that you can keep track of all of these variables is the way that engineers do it in industrial or maintenance engineering, you know, where they use project management, mm. they get all this stuff lined up, you have everything categorized, you have everything scheduled, and you know you have to have a compliant set of people that are willing to do that, or it just doesn't work. So um, that's in the nutshell of where yeah. we're at. You know, yeah. we're getting great results with the people that. Yeah, and that's a tremendous starting point. And, and I want to get into the specifics, which will kind of segue to the rest of our conversation. But before that, 
I'm curious about you as a person. So you mentioned, I think it was you started with environmental sciences and then did some anthropological study and then contractor and then yogi and breath work and meditative practices. Like I, I'm a, I'm a, a tale of two worlds as well. I'm very blue collar, nuts and bolts, wrestling, train hard, sweat, bro. Sure. And then the other side of me is, you know, a book like, um, um, untethered soul. Right. So I, I, I read a book like that that talks about like in and out and your passenger and your, your inner neighbor. And, and it's very, very the opposite of wrestling, fighting meathead in that. So how in the world do you go from like, was that always in you that the, the, the meditation meditative practice stuff, did, was it a kind of the opposite of the contracting world that you were drawn to? What, how did that come about? Um, I was in a relationship at the time and this, uh, that, that person was really into yoga and got me to start practicing and then got me to do this really intense teacher training mm -hmm. yoga. And it just kind of cracked me open. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. And I just, I, I really didn't know anything about you. Yeah. Right? I never really thought about looking into it. I've always been like, you know, I was an athlete and, you know, rock climber and mountain biker. I was pole vaulter in high school, like to walk on and at U of I, you know, as a kicker, I, just, I never really played, but, <laughs> um, but um, it was fun. You know, I was always an athlete, always doing really great stuff, but I never thought that yoga was something that I would want to get into until um, I started doing it with her. And then we got into this teacher training. And what I noticed was that like all these like injuries that I had been dealing with that, you know, I would work around, like I'd still climb my shoulder kind of hurt, mm -hmm. you know, my back wasn't great. You know, my hips were okay. And sometimes my knees would act up. And then after about three months of yoga, I didn't have anything, you know? And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. You know? And then you just started opening up into like different layers of yourself and whether you liked it or not you were becoming aware or i was becoming aware of all the delusions that i had created to make my world around me and it's not comfortable and i think you can do one or two things you can either like say okay this is knowledge that i can use to make myself better you know or i'm going to shut all that out and i'm just going to go back to my deluded life so for something that that could potentially sound very abstract, what you're saying to me hits home 100 million percent because I'm, I'm living it right now. It's like something so simple as when I was wrestling and fighting, my diet was horrible. I, I, I never even thought twice about it. Right. But then now later in life, I'm like, maybe I should start actually thinking about my health. And like, then I, I have kids and maybe I should like start thinking about my longevity. I have a book here in front of me called the Align method, which I just started reading today. So it, 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 there is a shift from like, you know, lack of better phrase, balls to the wall, train, fight, win to, okay, like I'm done with that. How do I actually be a healthy human now? Because that, as you get older, your perspective changes and that's what you want. Yeah. Now you're asking yourself questions. The correct. And, and then learning things. And then you said like undoing all those other things. Yeah. I remember like right after starting yoga, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, I you know my diet wasn't great back then. And I'm sitting there and I, I, and there's a steak burrito in front of me. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the steak burrito, which I've had, I don't know how many times as a kid, you know, uh, college and whatnot. And I'm like, do I agree with this thing and sitting in front of me? Yeah. Right. And I'm just like, no, I don't agree with it on a nutritional aspect. I definitely don't agree with it on an ethical aspect. And I'm like, who knows where these animals came from and what they were, what was done to them. Right. And I don't agree with like the carbon impact and that in the, you know, impact on my environment. I'm like, I have an environmental science major. I knew all about, you know, like, I'm like, I don't agree with any of that shit, mm -hmm. but here I am about to eat it. And that was the last time I ate meat. It's very unsettling, like that thought process. Right. And I was just like, wow, I'm a complete hypocrite mm -hmm. to everything I know. Yeah. It's very unsettling. That whole process, man, I'm hitting those blocks, like not every day, but in the past yeah. few years. It's really uncomfortable. Right. And, you know, um, the more you do that, though, the, the better you feel about yourself. And I so, think that's 
it comes down to you really have to you really have to be okay with yourself you know because the harshest judge is yourself upon yourself and if if you're a really tough judge and you don't agree with what you're doing you're not going to be very nice to other people nor yourself you're gonna be miserable yeah internally miserable so I want to, if, if I lose my place, maybe you can help remind me. I want to connect that, right? That realization you got from yoga to what you do now. But before we get there, I want to backtrack a little bit. Earlier you said, so I'll just use anti-aging or reversing re reversing aging as the, the like the, the pole here. Yeah. You said that, that pharmaceuticals are involved, but no one's doing anything for the person. Uh, it, or so, can you like clean up my interpretation yeah, of that? So there's a whole bunch of, you have lifespan.io, you have the Buck Institute, you have all these different um, meetings about aging and scientists working on the aging problem, right? So one of the things that's, that we've learned about aging is that aging is a disease, which no one really classifies, but it's a disease because it affects the cells and how they function. And most diseases are secondary to aging. And you, what you do as you think about it is when you're in your 20s, what can you do to yourself? And nothing happens. Almost everything, right? You'll see 20-year-olds, garbage diet, not sleeping, partying hard, using all kinds of substances, and they perform unbelievably. Because right? Yeah, kind of what I was saying about wrestling and fighting. I never thought twice about it. Because they're young. But, you know, as you age, you can't do that, right? You want to age and you want to still be able to perform really well. Well, like, like a Tom Brady, right? Does Tom Brady, like, still party and, like, eat garbage and stuff like that? No. If he wants to perform the way he performs, he has to be perfect about what he does, right? And that's what the body can do then, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's the real basis of things is we need to be young. So if we can reverse age to be young, well, then you have to worry about all this cardiovascular stuff and cancers and that kind of thing. Great that we're pouring all this knowledge and money into figuring the problem out, but what do we do in the meantime? And so that's where clinics like mine come in is because we're the, we're the gap there. So maybe in 20 or 30 years or whatever it is, there's going to be some stuff that you can take and some things that might be mainstream. But what if you're 70 years old, right? You got, and all your grandparents and everybody lived to be about 80, 82, something like that. So you got 10, 12 years left on the planet. Mm -hmm. If you're playing odds, which you should, and everybody should think about this, right? But everyone thinks they're going to live forever for some reason. No one ever plans. So even if you're an 85 year old, you're still like, oh, you're not planning for death. Yeah. Um, which would be a really good idea for people to do because it'd be a lot easier to like transition. Have you real quick? Have you ever read or, or heard of um, "Being Mortal" by Atul Gawande? Uh, I know the author. Yeah, but he written a lot of stuff. But listeners, yeah. if you just read with, with what Doctor Alex said, that that's what that book is about. Basically, is our lack of planning for yeah. death. Yeah, so it's really um, something that people should think about, but. Say like today, if you're doing age reversal practices and, you know, we don't have a lot of weight data and stuff, but if you're doing a lot of the things and you're taking a lot of the supplements and you're doing the hormones and you're taking the age reversal medicines, maybe somewhere between 10 and 20% life extension from whatever you got left. So that's going to buy you X amount of time. Well, in five years, there'll probably be something better to buy you a little bit more time. So all we can do right now is buy time. But if you can buy enough time in the future, things are going to get better and better and better at this very problem because there's so many people looking at it. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're doing what you can now because when you age and you physically age at a molecular level, it's really difficult to undo that, right? If you if I have somebody when they're young enough and we start these things, well, then they notice incredible change. But if I get somebody that's like 75 years old and I start a lot of these things, I don't see that much because so many of their genes have been turned off. 
So we got to catch you before your genes get turned off if we can. Now, if you're 75, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try, mm-hmm. right? You're just probably not going to get as robust of, uh, you know, return on your, on your investment if your time and all these types of things, but it's still, you got to do something or you're not going to, you're just going to have to accept what's going to happen to you then. So my, my brother, I reference this often, but because it's a big deal, my, my oldest brother has a glioblastoma and he's had two brain surgeries and, and he's <sighs> going through a, a trial right now. <sighs> and he, he's like, I'll, I think surprisingly is a good word living i mean living you, see, you wouldn't know it you'd be like oh hey hey guy how are you you know you wouldn't know it and yeah. one of the things you know you, you encourage and we'll get more into it with your practices but you, you encourage and i say you like everyone you know eat well move exercise etc cetera, etc cetera. but you don't do it you the average person doesn't do it because there's no short-term effect when i went down with him to md anderson the last time i mean the doctor said the reason that we're able to do these things is because you are so healthy and the stronger your body is the more things we can try and there was almost like that timeline of what you said like stay well and healthy as long as you can because then there might be something else and then then maybe but if your body is too beaten up we can't even try it yeah no you can't i mean you know i don't know if i always make everyone do not make but i suggest everyone does strength training Mm-hmm. like real strength training. Um, I mean, Mark Ripto, like the guy who started starting strength, you know, he's got that saying, you know, uh, strong people are hard to kill. Mm-hmm. And it, he's absolutely right. You know, if, if you get admitted to the ICU, you know, and you've got a good amount of muscle mass on you and you're strong, you're going to last a long time. Your body's going to use all of that energy that's stored to help you. You know, and your mitochondria are working really well, mm-hmm. but you know, somebody who's maybe like a marathon runner, right. Who doesn't have all that muscle mass and stuff like that. They're not going to do so great. They don't have all those reserves. So, I mean, it's really important. And it's just, that's why it's so difficult to do this type of medicine because you can't just take this pill or do yeah. this hormone or take these couple of supplements. It's like, we have to figure out like what's going on with your spirit first, right? Do you have a plan for what you want to do in life? You know, I I love using Dr. Jordan Peterson's uh, website, Mm selfauthoring.com, right? What a great thing that he gave to to the world, right? It's like 30 bucks. It's like one of the best things you could ever do for yourself, right? And like, just set yourself straight on what you want to do and how you're going to do it. And that just clears up so much stuff. And then, you know, are you breathing well? How are you breathing? And then we have you work with biofeedback specialists to see if you're actually in coherence or not. You know, what are you doing with your diet? How are you eating? Are you fasting? When are you fasting? Right? We already know there's so many benefits from fasting. So there's yeah. so many things that people can do that don't cost anything that you can already do to extend your life. I, I, and then you do all the other stuff. I mean, it just works so much better. Yeah, and it doesn't have so I want to get into kind of complexities and or resistance from maybe mainstream, but also from people, clients, uh, uh, patients. Uh, But what you just said there hit nail on the head of what I was thinking in my mind. So, all right, so you mentioned Jordan Peterson and the self authoring. I've never done it. My buddy did it. He said it was awesome. Um, The book Breath, which came out not too long ago. um, James Esther. Yeah. Everyone should. Actually, yeah, reading. it is in like uh, Wim Hof slash his book, um, strength, strength training, like th- those things. So cold training, breath, and I'll say meditation. But I don't really mean traditional meditation, but me being present and breathing, which ties on both of them are regular things I do every day, six That's out fantastic. of seven days a week. And it's it's not hard at all. Most of it is like combining them, the breathing when I'm lifting and then the cold shower and then a sauna like it's just it, it works it's integrated into my life so it doesn't have to be big and scary it, it's very simple stuff yeah super simple i mean i even get people even simpler things you know it's like when people get older they trip and they fall it's well documented right you got somebody 74 years old you know, they're retired, they play golf, they're, everything's fine, they got a great life, or nobody worries about them. They trip, they fall, they break their hip, and then there's this downward spiral of their life. Right? So it's not if you're gonna fall, it's when everybody trips, right? 
It's just, I don't know, you take like a 20 something year old and you trip them up, they probably won't go down. Right. They'll probably do something fa fabulous, you know, <laughs> and they'll catch themselves before eating it. Right. Yeah, yeah. But some 75 year olds not going to do anything fabulous. They're just going to go down hard. Right. Unless they've really trained. Maybe they're a martial artist. Maybe they've yeah. trained, you know, kind of stuff like that. But it's pretty rare. So really simple things I have people do is like when you're brushing your teeth, stand on one foot. Don't use your toes to grab the ground. A lot of people use their toes to grab when they're trying to balance, you know, and it just wrecks the way your foot's designed. You know, your toes are meant to just kind of feel the ground, not to grip. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the ball of your foot you really want to work, which nobody's feet work well that wear shoes all the time. So, you know, stand there barefoot, brush your teeth with one hand, the opposite hand usually, and stand on that foot and try not to use your toes. And when you can do that for a minute, then do it with your eyes closed. And the people that have really good balance in that way, they're really hard to trip. It's like kind of fascinating what you're just saying. And it almost is gamifying the redundancies of life at the same time. You know, it's like that. Yeah, and it's like, you know, every time I tell someone that really, you have to go to the bathroom, what, five, six, seven times a day, right? So every time you urinate, I give them a one or a few different breathing exercises to do while they're urinating. You know, it's like, all right, how are you going to breathe? How are you going to do breathing exercises five times a day? Well, you got to pee five times a day. Yep. So take a minute when you pee to do a breathing exercise. The, the book I just mentioned that I'm reading now, he says how important it is just be on the ground, like down on the ground and get back up again. Like simple stuff that keeps your joints, I don't know, like fluid or liquidated. I don't, right. I don't know the science of it, but sure. Just look at any martial art or any yoga yeah. you're going to do that a million times right uh i want to kind of backtrack a little bit but with your with your or how much that'll be the question how much so your your focus on yoga and then getting into yourself questioning and then doing what you do now like how much of that kind of realization through yoga leads to the type of medicine that you do now a lot a little i mean probably a lot but like um so I looked at like the old yogis and like how they're able to move. And even like from my lineage in Shaolin, like some of the old Shaolin masters and, you know, how they age and things like that. They definitely age better than regular people, you know, and depending on the practitioner and how long they practiced for and they took it seriously and things like that. But the thing that they couldn't do is they couldn't live more than what human life usually yeah. affords. So the basis of everything is eat well, sleep well, breathe well, move, do all this kind of stuff. But that's not going to buy you an extra amount of life. It's just going to buy you a quality of life, which is fantastic, right? But without the kind of medicine that we're offering, you're not going to get this extension of life into possibly hundreds of years when it really starts kicking in, right? Imagine if you started doing a 20% extension on life when you were 30. Right. Let's say you were 30 and your lifespan was going to be to 80 years old. So that gives you 50 years. Right. Well, if you get to extend that by 20 percent. Right. There's another decade of life. And if you don't become decrepit at the end of your life and you will live your life, you know, healthy and then drop like a bird, well, that might buy you two decades. Right. Because most people in the Western Hemisphere, when they their last decade of life is either in a nursing home a wheelchair or demented or something right so it's not high quality of life yeah the meds might keep you alive but they're not going to give you quality so th this is what we're really focused on in this you know with cancer there's a brand new test it's called the braille test you know it should be available to everybody but they're because we're kind of bleeding edge stuff these kind of tests come to us first so the Grail test, what it's showing is that you can pick up about 50 different kinds of cancers from their organ of uh, origin. And then it picks up on cancers from stage one all the way through stage four. If you can pick up a cancer in stage one or two in regular medicine, they can treat that pretty well. Yep. But stage three and four are very difficult. So that, you can look into it. It's, it's called the Grail test. And we're offering it here. And, you know, the people that can afford it every year, just get it, you know, because if we find stuff early, you can treat it. 
you know, we can also help people out further, you know, that are further along, but, you know, um, as you know, cancer is a really difficult problem. And an even more difficult problem is, is dealing with the psyche of those people that have it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the indoctrination that happens in the red, regular medical institutes. So, you know, and that's one of the problems that we have just in general is education. So you're really well-to-do people that will go to the university clinics all around the country, right? Whether it's, you know, Stanford or University of Chicago or whatever it is, and they think that that's the top level of medicine that exists, right? But it just isn't, right? It is for like that particular like surgery or that particular like machine or whatever it is, but they're not geared at trying to reverse your age And they're also not geared at trying to use engineering principles to optimize the function of your body. It's just not how medicine's set up. Medicine's Mm -hmm. set up um, based on problems. So you have this problem and this is what we're gonna do for that problem. But they're not looking at all the systems. Imagine like if the airplane came in and they're like, oh, there's something wrong with the hydraulics. And all they did was deal with the hydraulics and then say, okay, send that, that plane on to the next destination. How many people do you think would be dead, right? If we just dealt with the problems that happened, yeah, right. So I mean, no, no engineer deals with problems. They all deal with. They're all focused on optimization. So then problems who, are just things that arise. So then, who is the best? Like, it, so you know, I think I, I know the answer to the question. But like, I, I understand what you're saying on on both a, uh, a a practical manner, right? But then also from personal experiences that I've had. I had a stroke when I was 29. And it was the first time that I really like I would go through all this stuff and I thought to myself, no knock on anything. But I was like, oh, they don't know. Like they don't know. There's there's a thing that they do and then you're put into this one. And then it's like uh, a a computer program. Like you go with this problem, you get this test, then you go to this one. There's a funnel that leads to whatever. And at times you just want to say, stop, 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 stop. Like, listen to me. Talk to me. Listen to me. So that is a path and it's i feel like not in your world but i feel like that makes sense for the mass like how do we organize hundreds of millions of people we have this system set up right i feel like you're taking a I different mean, yeah i mean it, it's it's expensive right so i mean the amount of staff that i need and the amount of checks that we have to go through for each patient to optimize them could you do that you know to all the whole population not right now right? Because it hasn't been done. It's outside of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to happen to regular medicine. We're never going to really infiltrate that with these types of systems. It's, I mean, you you just, it's not going to happen. Correct. It's too hard to change everything that they're doing to be optimization based versus problem based. Right. And they don't have the bandwidth and they don't even have the training. I mean, you know, I have a lot of doctors that come to me for their optimization. Well, they're physicians. They could prescribe everything themselves, but they don't because they didn't get this kind of training. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't get any of this training in med school. They didn't get any of this training in the residency, right? They don't, they, physicians aren't taught how to do bioidentical hormone replacement, which is in my eyes is 25 years old, right? You know, we've had so much data in it. I mean, it's, it's crazy that why somebody wouldn't do it. Yeah. Right. Um, they don't know age reversal techniques. They still don't really know how to read all these genetic tests. Right. They have no idea about toxins, which toxins are in your body, how to measure them, how to get them out. So all these things that are like routine for us or microbiome and, you know, and how you deal with your microbiome, how you test the microbiome, how you enhance the microbiome, what the microbiome is actually doing to both your cognition and your immune system. It's, just, it's unknown to them because it's not part of their training. Yeah. I liken it on a very elementary level to, to like, if I grow vegetables for my house, I can do that. And then they say, Hey, Charlie, you got to grow vegetables for your state. And it's like, well, I can't do that. Like, it's just, it's not able to be done. So that's like an analogy for what we're talking about here. It's just not able to be done on a large scale. So then where did your training, where did, where did your knowledge of this come from? And, and I guess, how did you, yeah, where did it come from and how did you start that path? I mean, I just think it comes from a desire first, right? 
So um, a desire to really optimize myself. So from yoga to Shaolin Kung Fu, to going back to school, it's just like, okay, what's next? What's next? Where's the missing piece here? So doing regular medicine and then doing functional medicine or regenerative medicine, and I'm like, okay, so it's dealing with some of these things, but I need more information. So then it's age reversal stuff and you just got to stay on the bleeding edge. And really, if I didn't have a lot of friends that were engineers, I wouldn't have been pushed down the pathway of uh, maintenance engineering. So when you look, you can just look it up, you know, industrial engineering and then maintenance engineering. It's probably one of the youngest fields of engineering as far as like, I mean, there's you know, computer engineering, all that kind of stuff, but I mean, that's just subsets. But industrial engineering was designed because of the industrial revolution. So they had all these really complex systems because companies were getting really complex and machines were getting really complex. So we needed engineering to deal with really complex systems and how we're going to maintain them. So if you give, if you give an engineer, say, a machine that comes off the line somewhere and they want to optimize that machine, they'll probably make it run better than it was designed to and they'll probably make it last longer than it was designed to because that's just what engineers do. Mm-hmm. You know? But a physician, when they're giving your body... Are they making your body last longer than it was kind of designed to be? And are you, are you making it the most, are you getting the most out of it that you can? And the answer is no. Right. And all you have to do is just look at the general population. Yeah. Right. The general population is obese, deconditioned, right. They have multiple diseases and all the medicine and all the help that they're trying to give these people is to deal with a problem. And that problem is a really basic problem. It's like, you're not moving and you're not eating right. Right. Can you imagine if your, if your medicine was just focused on optimizing you rather than dealing with problems that are super basic. Right. So that's what it comes down to. I, I feel like I get, a, 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 I have a, a, from everything we've been talking about from you personally, you know, I feel like I have a, a pretty good sense for, for your mission and, and you, your purpose and why you're doing this. It, it must, well, may not, I'll ask rather than, than state, like, does it drive you crazy? Like, have you ever seen uh, uh, Mugatu, Zoolander, when Mugatu, they're, they're talking about something. So Zoolander, you ever see Zoolander comedy with yeah, Ben Stiller? Yeah, and Mugatu's like, whatever he says about taking crazy pills. Like, does no one see what's going on? Like, am I taking crazy pills? Does it drive you insane that like, you just want to have a megaphone and say like, eat well and move. <laughs> it, it, Cause it drives me I mean, insane. And I'm not nearly as invested as you are. You know, it used to. And then, you know, it just doesn't anymore because I think just people are going to do what they're going to do. Um, I used to try to want to just, help everyone that walked in the door and I still do, but like you have to be truly invested in yourself. And at some point you have to like take responsibility for what happens to you. And I can't do that for somebody. I can kind of point the way, but they have to really like get it. Somebody has to get it. They all have to get it. And every person has their own path, you know, but if, the, if you can give them the basics that they're in control if they wish to be in control and they believe it, then they can make change. Yeah. But if they keep thinking that they're a victim and that, you know, something's wrong with me and you have to fix me, it ain't going to happen. Right? So I would love to just, you know, somebody comes in and I say, here, this is what we're going to do for you. Uh, you're going to be amazing. You know, but that's not what I tell people. I'm like, here, look, I'm like, I have all these algorithms, right? We have this whole set of things for you to do and this progression of things that you're going to do, working you towards optimization, but you are not an animal in a cage. You have free will to do whatever you want. So it's really up to you to be able to do these things. And the reason I use the animal in the cage thing is one of my mentors, you know, indirectly is Dr. Michael Colgan from the Colgan Institute in Salt Spring Island. He worked with lots of you know, Olympic athletes, professional athletes, getting them optimized. And one of his friends was, I guess, involved in thoroughbred racehorses. And he said, hey, can you use your protocols for horses? 
you know, and he'd been in horses for a long time. He's like, sure, let's just see how it works. Um, and he was blown away, right? Because normally with athletes, you know, well, this works sometimes and that, do that doesn't work all the time. This works okay. But with the horses, it worked every time. And he's like, wait a minute, what's going on here, right? Why do my protocols work so much better with animals than they do with the humans, mm -hmm. right? Well, the animal's 100% compliant. Yeah. You put the animal to bed, bed animal goes to bed, right? <laughs> you want to take the animal out to work? Animal works out. Animal gets X amount of calories, X amount of macros, gets these supplements, gets these injections, right? Everything's perfect. Good luck with that with a human being. I think that's one of the best <laughs> examples I've heard, maybe about explaining anything like the, the, the simplicity kind of of it. Like it, it could be that, like it could be effective if you do the right things, like the idea of being a good patient. But Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, the difficulty in my job is to try to figure out what's the new thing and is it worth spending money on? Is it worth putting into the protocol? Right. So that's, that's me always looking out, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to retard this mechanism? How are we going to, how are we going to enhance this mechanism? Da, da, da. What peptides are we going to use? What supplements are we going to use? What, you know, what testing are we going to get? That's my, that's the difficulty for me. Patients come in the door, we go through their whole history and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, here's a list of their problems, but this is how we're going to work to optimize it. Very few times do I have to really change what we're doing to deal with these problems hmm. right? once in a while i gotta you know deal with these things directly right because there's something of concern and it needs follow-up but a lot of times just following optimization protocols all those problems will just go away on their own yeah right the difficulty is dealing with the persona of that of that individual right and their resistance patterns to doing breathing or the resistance patterns to getting rid of a bad relationship so those right. or whatever that, it is, that's the protocol that you're alluding to something two simple things like that, breathing and getting rid of toxic relationships. Yeah, I mean, that's a couple of things, right? But like, yep. you know, easier said than done. Yeah. Right. I mean, people they get something out of their toxic relationship. Because it's and, and I, I want to get into kind of the specifics of the Pazio Institute. But if you've never heard anyone talk about this stuff before, listeners, you could be like, well, protocol that's i know i charlie think well protocol that's a fancy word like what's he talking about he's talking about breathing he's talking about exercise weight training he's talking about getting rid of toxic relationships probably stretching mobility eating whole foods like th th that's not super scientific stuff but it can help dramatically if you do it and it's the foundation right like if you were like not sleeping well you know like i've got plenty of professionals think that they can live on five hours of sleep Right? They're like, oh, I've been doing it for two decades. And I'm like, it doesn't mean that you're not taking extra damage. Yeah. Right. You're used to it. Your body's, you know, dealing with it, but you're definitely aging faster because of it. And we yeah. have great data, right? Go talk to Dr. Matthew Walker. He's got plenty yeah. of it. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, are you tracking your sleep? No. Do you go to bed at the same time every day? No. Right. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I'm saying. Just, you know, just, these are just the basics. So like, if you don't have a good foundation, then all the other stuff that we're doing for you to extend your lifespan and stuff, it won't work as well, right? The better your foundation is, the better everything else works. I mean, it's just pretty simple. Um, we don't have enough time and money and, you know, to have somebody like monitor you 24 seven, right? Yeah, it'd be great to have somebody like, you know, calling you every single day, multiple times a day. Did you take your supplements? Did you sleep? Did you, you know, but mm -hmm. you know, that's not going to happen, but we can create, you know, really good protocols for you and have somebody follow up with you at intervals, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, give you to other professionals that can help you when you're training and help you in your breathing and things like that, you know, which is much better than most places will do. Yeah. Uh, but you have to have some kind of gumption to want to do it. And I think that's why people come in the door here is because they, you know, they've researched it. They understand the benefit. They understand what they're already supposed to be doing. And they walk in the door and they're like, I'm ready. And then we do, you know, about three hours worth of work with them. 
before we even get them started on a program. And it, it's really interesting. I've been just kind of what you were talking about with yoga and you start thinking of everything differently and questioning. I'm kind of in a life point of doing that with every single thing. And I look sure. at what's marketed on TV and I'm thinking like the only reason that's market is, is because that's a reaction to what they, the masses want, right? So there's like this, sure. this reaction thing, but what, what we're talking about here, and maybe it's the same case or not, but at 40 with two small kids, post-competitive career, yeah. I'm so enamored with this thought of what we're talking about that it's it's one of the most exciting things for me to do is read a book like this, have a conversation with you about this stuff. And if you're young, most people are probably about my age, give or take five years that are listening right okay. now. But like, if you're not there in life yet, you will get there. And, and, and it's, it's such a time for me personally, talking to you is very timely because everything we're talking about right now is my primary focus. Like, how yeah. can I optimize myself as a human? And for the people listening, you know, one of the things to really grasp is the older you get, the faster you get old. And you can really see this. It's like when you were at 20 versus when you're 30, did you see really any difference in your capacity to like work out or perform? Hmm. No, right? You're about, you may be probably better at 30, yeah. right? But then you look at somebody when they're 70, maybe they just retired recently or something like that. They're playing golf, they're running around the planet doing whatever they're doing. And then you see them again at 80 and they're not the same person. Yeah. Right. You're like, what happened? Well, what happened is aging is exponential. Right. And that, you know, that moving from 70 to 80 was probably equal to like going from 40 to 70. It's, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. If you ever see this graph, it's like it just drops off like that, the way that aging and performance. So every decade you get older, you're getting older, you're, you're aging faster. Yeah. So when you start hitting 40, it starts getting pretty steep. And, you know, there's plenty of athletes you see at 30. There's not too many you see at 40. There's almost none at 50. Yeah. Right. That are competitive. Right. And so you can just see that. And that's kind of like a really good barometer for like, how well is your body able to perform? Right. So thinking that if you're thinking ahead, you're like, okay, by the time I hit 40, I have to start an age reversal program, right? I need to get my labs done to see where am I, where's my inflammation? What critical genes do I have? I need to get my heart scanned, you know, get a CT calcium score or a CTA or something. So I can see, do I have any blockages in, in my coronary vessels, right? Is there anything wrong with the, with the pump, right? Get your carotid scan. Is there any clots that are going on there? So, you know, get these, get a grail test, you know, is there any cancer brewing? Just, these are the things you want to do. And the, those are the things that are outside of what you can do, just staying healthy. And those things that, that you just said there, those are things that you do. Yeah, they're person. all part of protocols we have here, just getting people like, you know, and sometimes, you know, it's hard to even get people to do stuff. I, I was going to bring that up too. Like earlier, you mentioned, I don't know what words you said, but it sounded like injections. I, I hate injections. Yeah. Like I just feel very uneasy about anything. Right. Um, yeah. So I was, if I haven't already, I was going to ask about resistance from the mainstream that you might face, but also from people like from me who might come to you and be interested. Hey man, I want help. Okay. We're going to give you this, that, the other thing I can imagine there is some resistance because it is new. It is cutting edge. Yeah. From the people who um, actually, so that we kind of worked around that a lot. You know, I used to, I used to deal with a lot of a la carte patients and, and that's why I changed it over to an institute, you know, cause I want this to be an institute for learning as well as an institute for research. And if you're an a la carte patient, it means that you're in control, right? Well, if you were doing such a great job on your own, well, you didn't need me anyway, right? So that doesn't work because people show up whenever they want to show up, you know, get labs done whenever they want to get done. And so one, I don't have any good data and two, I can't really be helpful. So I changed it over to a membership model and you come on and it's like here for us to do the basics for you, you know, like, and I offer three different levels. So, you know, you don't have to go full on age reversal, 
but it's like you have to pick one of these packages mm-hmm. and you know they're like okay here's this chunk of money i don't want this money once if you can only pay me this money once don't show up right because one year out of your whole life doing something perfect isn't going to help you live longer it's just not right you have to be invested every year and you have to be invested that my life is the most important thing and if you put your life first and you make your life the best you can possibly make it well then you're going to have a cascade effect on the rest of the world right but if you don't have that belief system and you're not fully invested in it it's not going to work and so what we found is that people that come and they're they're like here this is what i'm going to give you every year right to optimize myself and this is what i'm invested towards they do fantastic right and it's just like anything you know if somebody gives you something for free yeah. or you can do it whenever you want, it doesn't, it's not worth anything. Yeah. I want to touch on this a little bit because I was that guy, right? I was that guy who wanted for free. And then I started my own business and now I realized what you're saying right there. And because fighting, like I didn't make a lot of money, especially early on coming up fighting. So I literally didn't have money for it. So it'd be like management. Okay. Yeah. What's the cost? Uh, this thing. Okay. What's the cost training? Okay. What's the cost? Because it was just, that's just my knee jerk reaction. Cause I didn't have money to pay for it. I want to, and I don't know how much your services cost, but what I do want to say to the listener is whether we're talking about Pazio Institute, whether we're talking about anything and it's a, a significant investment to me, it's like reading. Right. So a, a 85% of this podcast is me talking about books that I read. Right. I cover a new one every Monday. So people say, oh, my gosh, you read a book a week. That's insane. It's not insane. I believe in the investment of reading those books. So I front end my time knowing I'm going to be reading these books. Sure. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd love to invest in this, but it's got to be way too much money. It, it's it it won't it won't be Re- reading. is not too much time for me because I value it. Right. So. If you're inve- interested in an investment like this or anything else, it won't be crazy to you because it will be valued by you. So it's almost like self-fulfilling or something. Yeah, I mean, you you have to value it, right? And you have to really understand it. And to me, there's not there's nothing more important than your life and the quality of your life and the, and the the span of your healthy lifespan. So like. What's it worth to live 10 more years healthy? You ask somebody that's about to die, right? Um, and then there's people that I always hear this, you know, like, oh, I don't want to live past 80, right? I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to live forever. I don't want to live for hundreds of years. And I'm like, all right. So if you're healthy and you're 85 years old, you're still functioning, you can still like, walk anywhere you want, you have a conversation, you're not demented, are you just going to walk into a gas chamber one day? I want to die. Yeah. Right? I'm done. I'm I'm really done. I've seen everything. Really, you've seen and done everything. Right? I mean, just look, you're reading a book a week. At that rate, how long will it take you to get through all the really important books on the planet? A long time. (laughs) Right? I mean, you're never going to run out. Yeah. Right. You're never going to run out of things to do. You're never going to run out of things that are interesting places to go, things to learn, new hobbies. I mean, it's infinite. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100 percent. Just think people about can't that. wrap their mind around it. They're scared of what they don't know. Yeah. Um, talk about your, your institute uh, on the, the web. It's spelled out pretty well. So if, if you if if you're a complete novice to what he and I are talking about right now, if you go to his website, is it Pazio Institute dot? com or org yeah. or the institute.com yeah p-a-z-i-o it really spells it out well in, in a very like simple manner um in some of the category categories sports performance sexual performance i feel like it's either anti-aging or age reversal mm-hmm. um so how how do you what what do you do as an institute what are your services and like kind of how are they broken down so i guess like basic is somebody that's young right say somebody that doesn't need hormones yet maybe you know 33 and below or something like that, right? 35 and below. That person would just need to get some basic blood work, look at their inflammation, maybe get some genetics, maybe look for some cancer, look for toxins, things like that. Have some consults, get their lifestyle worked out, get their spirit in in check, and then be on the proper supplements 
that they need to age well. And then somebody say a little bit older, say 35 and above, maybe they start needing some hormone replacement. They start needing some peptides, things like that. And somebody that over the age of 50, they have to start doing age reversal medicines, you know, where they're getting more complicated workups. And that's kind of like our three tiers of service. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, I have over here, I have a ultrasound machine for um, musculoskeletal. So a lot of ex-athletes, fighters, all this kind of stuff, they have a lot of joint issues, but rather than going under the knife, you know, we can do a real time ultrasound mm -hmm. and look at that tissue as that person moves um, in a range of motion. So if you take an MRI, say of your shoulder, it's just a still picture. It's a really detailed picture and they can pick up a lot of damage, right? But it's a still picture. Whereas like if you're here in the clinic and we've got an ultrasound, say like an supraspinatus or something like that, and you're going through this range of motion, well, I can see how that muscle's moving. I can see the insertion. I can see the origin. I can see if there's like, you know, tendonitis or if there's like a tear in the muscle. And then the ultrasound has this thing called needle guided um, injection. So I can take PRP and, or, you know, exosomes or whatever, and inject it into that area and then it's not a blind injection you're injecting right where that person's injured and they'll start seeing themselves repair really quickly um and you know if they i'm sure the listeners they know prp is uh platelet-rich plasma there's a lot of clinics that say they have prp but it's not all the same a lot of people are just doing it in-house you know they just put it in testing they draw off the plasma that's not prp all right, PRP is a highly concentrated version. And, you know, like we, we have a machine here that, you know, does 12X, it concentrates all these uh, growth factors 12 times. So you start with like a 60 CC volume of blood and you get like five CCs of product, All right? So and not everything's the same. So when you're yeah. talking regenerative medicine, that's huge, especially for like what I believe to be the people that are listening to this podcast. Yeah. So, um, you can do a lot with just injections and regenerative medicine, along with some peptides and supplements and proper training, you know, versus just get going under the knife. Yeah. I've seen, so, and not that, you know, sometimes you need surgery, right. Depending on the damage, but a lot of times you don't, you know, um, my knee is a perfect example, right? I had my knee shredded by a kid that trapped my knee. <laughs> um, and then uh, I tore the meniscus and I had another guy, this huge 270 pound guy landed on my leg with another guy blocking it, tore my uh, vastus medialis oblique, which is a quad off the bone. Mm. I've never had surgery. I've always just done regenerative medicine, yoga, Kung Fu, and I have wow. full mob mobility in my knee. So yeah, people aren't aware of that possibility. I think a lot of people aren't right. aware of even that possibility. Yeah. And that's just like kind of one more thing. So we're, you know, I try to do a little bit of everything here because everything's necessary to optimize. You. Who and I try to keep everything under one house, you know, cause the thing that's happening to so many people is that they have eight specialists and none of them talk to each other. There's not one place that's trying to like be the head coach. And so when people come in the door and they start a program with me, I'm just like, do you give me the authority to be the head coach? And if you don't, then it's not going to really work out so well, right? Not work out well for you or for me, because, you know, we're going to have discussions about, all right, you're going to go see this cardiologist. What did he say? Well, I agree with this. I don't agree with that. This is why this is what we're going to do. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to send you out to this guy to do that. All right. We're going to come back. We're going to convene. We're going to talk about it. And then we're going to create a plan. So everything's understood and it's not that we're not using these people, but they're all kind of like special teams coaches mm -hmm. because they don't have in their head, the big picture of how do we optimize you? Yeah. When I was fighting my, my trainer manager for the first time taught me the idea of you, you don't want too many chefs in the kitchen. And I didn't really understand what that meant back then, but I do now doing my own thing, you know, building something different. I, I understand that completely. And then at a personal experience, a, a recent hospital experience for me. So my brother has brain cancer. My mom has um, an autoimmune disease at the hospital. 
I, I mean, what I said to my dad was it's like the, the right hand is not talking to the left hand. Like, it's just, it's just, it's just the same. And again, going back to earlier, I'm not condemning that because it does a lot of for my mom and my brother, but sure. it's just, it's the best system for the way it is there. But what you're talking about, it is something completely different. Yeah. I mean, you, you can go to Mayo Clinic and go wherever you want, you know, they're not going to do anything to extend the quality of your life or optimize you. They just don't have the, they don't have the medicine. Yeah. It's not set up for that. Who's your clientele? Like you mentioned uh, athletes was one of the things that stepped out in my mind, but is it kind of like average person? Is it? Definitely not the average person because of the cost. Right. So I'd say on average, I don't know, depends on the age group, but 40 plus people on average are probably spending about 18 K a year. Okay. Right. Um, and then it's, we don't have really good margins here. You know, like if you, if you bring, bring in a lot of business people, you know, they'd want our margins to be a lot greater, but we can't afford it because it's already too expensive. Yeah. So we have to be on, on tighter margins uh, just because of the cost of the supplements and the peptides and everything else. Yeah. Right. And just running the place. And to be honest, I don't think, because I, I literally had no idea and I wasn't going to ask because I didn't know if you want to say it out loud or not, but that doesn't sound crazy to me because there are like mastermind business groups that are 50 K wow. or uh, it's wow. like it's insanity. Yeah, and it's right? a and lot the of amount, what you get here for what you're spending, you know, when you break it down is just incredible, right? Because there's not a, really a part of your optimization that's not included. Yeah. And even for people that have like resistant, like, you know, anxiety, depression, and things like that. We offer ketamine psychotherapy. So, which has really profound effects on yeah. people. You know, I talk about breaking you open and allowing you to see, you know, without the delusion of your ego, you know, how, how powerful that is, you know, but it's not just the ketamine, right? Or whatever, you know, substance you're going to be using. It's, you know, what did you do to lead up to that session, right? You know, how, did, were you, did you really dial in what you what you wanted to do, right? Did you figure out what suggestions that you're missing? And then when you learn something in that space, did you integrate it into your life? So there's a lot of like pre-work and there's a lot of post-work that goes into something like that. So what you're saying there, exactly what you said, you, I feel like you could have said that about ketamine or psychedelic therapy. Like, do, do you get involved in, in that at all as well or have any plans to? Yeah, so psychedelic therapy and ketamine therapy is the same thing, okay. right? Um, it's just what substance you're using. Yeah, yeah. And um, legally, we can use ketamine. Yeah. So it's great. And there's, you know, if you ever want to learn about it, you, there's a great book out there. It's called The Ketamine Papers. Okay. Um, so it really kind of goes into the detail and like, Ketamine turns on like brain derived uh, growth factor. It does a whole bunch of things to like reset your brain. Yeah. It's fantastic, but it's temporary. Yeah. So you have to take action on what you're doing. And the same thing goes for the, all the psychedelics, right? You're going to learn something. And if you don't apply it, it's not going to do anything for you. With right. The theme and of this, yeah. if, if the psychedelics alone were that great, well, then everyone that followed the dead or fish would be enlightened. That's a and I know interesting. Plenty thought. of them, and they're not. That's a funny thought. <laughs> not that I don't like deadheads or if it, you know, <laughs> but you know, it's just not about the drug. It's how it's being utilized. Yeah. Um, and and the context. Listeners, I, I talked about um, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, and I will be talking about your mind on plants here soon. But if you're interested in any of what we're talking about in this segment those two books are, are definitely good ones to to um to follow so the, kind of to round this out because we're just over an hour right now resistance right mainstream resistance um any resistance i feel like it, it, you know you as a person i feel like you've been through a lot you've done a lot you've been kind of paving your own path so i don't know how much it would affect you like spiritually emotionally but do you hit much resistance from either mainstream and or people Not really i mean like I, there's just the resistance is out there um in the pharmaceutical lobbies and in the lobbies for the insurance companies 
um, but mostly the pharmaceuticals, um, they have control over so much. So like things like peptides are starting to get regulated, not because they need to be regulated. So there's like all this stuff that's happening, like stem cells. We have such great results with stem cells. Why they're so tightly regulated is beyond me, right? That this is just old school. So those kinds of things bother me, but people leave me alone. And you know, any physician that I send people to or that come to me, they like having me help their patients because they don't have the time to do all this stuff. Yeah. Right. And it just makes their job easier when I optimize them. Yeah. So it wasn't like that in the past, though. I think it's there's been a, a big change in the last couple of years where patients have been educating doctors on what they're doing elsewhere. And then they're like, oh. To, you know, and they share their labs and all this stuff. And what the other physicians see is like, oh, your blood pressure is much better controlled and your labs are better and you don't need this medicine anymore. It just made my life easier. That's a really, <laughs> that's a really like weird and, and real thing that you just said, because I listen to so many, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I am very excited that I'm having this conversation with you and not listening to you on another podcast because it could very easily be that way. So I'm actually able to talk to you. But I have found myself thinking in my head, kind of what you, like, I, I feel like I've gleaned a lot of information, a lot of knowledge that I could, you know, next time, if when I go to the doctor, share. And I'm always kind of afraid because when someone tries to tell me how to fight, I'm like, okay, buddy. You know, so I, I, I never want to be that guy. But what you're saying is true. Like, there's a lot of stuff that, Ah, people don't hear about because they're doing their thing. Yeah, you know, you don't have to share everything. I mean, like, unfortunately, your average physician has about seven minutes with you. Yeah. Right? Because they have to do all this charting and all this other stuff for insurance. So if, like, they had a 15-minute appointment, 15 minute appointment set for you, more than half of that time is charting for them. Yeah. And the computer are doing kind of worthless stuff. All right? Um, and so that doesn't give them much time. So all they have is, like, all right, you came in for this problem and you talked to you really quickly about this specific problem and what we're going to do, but they don't have time to do everything else. Yeah. So if, the, if you tell them, Hey, you know, I'm seeing this doctor and, you know, I get to see this person, you know, X amount of times per year. And my shortest visit is one hour and we cover topics from A to Z and this is how I'm feeling better and I'm sleeping better. And, my blood pressure is better at home or my blood sugar is so much better controlled. They're, they're thrilled. Right. This has been great, man. Like I said, we're over an hour. Uh, please, as we send off, share, you know, whatever you'd like to share. I, I think it's fascinating. Have you written any books? I haven't. I have one in the works, but yeah, I'm, I'm another year out. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it because I really enjoy what we're talking about. And I'm, like I said, it's a, it's, it's like a, a major, part of my life is learning about this stuff uh, there's a there's a conference coming up in portugal called healthy masters um people can look it up a lot of the leading experts in age reversal will be there speaking um i'll be speaking there again i was their um, um their keynote speaker last year so um i'll be giving updates on medical engineering and medical engineering's um role in yeah. age reversal in the future yeah um, most of the people will just be talking about different modalities that are being researched or being used. Um, I kind of talk about how we're going to integrate all this today. Yeah. Um, and is that virtual as like, we'll be, yeah, that'll be a virtual conference as well. And it's called, what is it? Healthy masters, healthy masters, healthy masters. Healthy masters. Yeah. And do you, I haven't seen anything, but do you do any, any personal and or Pazio, uh, social media? We do. We have like an Instagram page, but you know, it hasn't been super active lately. Okay. Um, right. We're probably going to work on it in the future. It's just um, most of the people that come to us are word of mouth. Yeah. You know, sometimes they'll come from a podcast or they'll come from a conference or something like that. But, you know, when it comes to something that's so uh, comprehensive and costs a lot of money, people want to hear directly from another person that's done it. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but it just is. And so, you know, we're growing organically in that way, but really what I'd like is I'd like people to take on this stuff. I think in the future, I'm going to do some more education for other physicians. 
Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative because again, this is a first, something I'm really interested in, learned a lot about, never had a conversation like this, was kind of nervous for it because it's a little bit out of my, my wheelhouse, but I appreciate just how you explain it. You're, I'm a, a very uh, simple guy when I ask questions, but I feel like it was a really good cohesive conversation, man. So I appreciate uh, I'm it. Glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope a lot of people got a lot out of it and they can, you know, look at my website and, then go to age-reversal.net and learn about age reversal, you know, healthy masters, rad fest. So there's so much out there, a uh, lot to learn, but definitely get someone to guide you. You do not want to biohack your way through this. Yeah. Right. Um, I have a lot of biohackers and I love that they're super interested in this, but they don't really understand the implications of doing some of these things. And they're not getting all the proper testing that they need to as they go. Yeah. Well, again, thanks so much for being here, man. This was awesome. It's great. And a pleasure to be on the show.